This is the, the, the Analysis in Change with Nathan Williams and Neil Kieran. <laughs> Welcome to Analysis in Chains. I'm Nathan Williams. Joining me today is Ryan Taylor, the Dash Core CEO. Ryan, thank you very much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Nathan, for having me on. Ryan, you came from a Wall Street background in order to join the crypto scene. What was behind that decision? Well, I was working at a, at a hedge fund at the time, um, and we had a wide variety of different different funds within that entity. We had a private equity fund and a couple pub- public market markets funds. And the way that we were organized was by vertical. And my vertical that I covered for them was payments. And so starting in 2012, I started to take notice of Bitcoin and, you know, on into 2013, I, I really started to take notice and started to get involved a little bit in the space. Um, I identified Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as um, as really filling a need within the market that just hadn't existed up to that point. And cryptocurrencies have such unique attributes that make them ideal for certain types of transactions that I knew that there was value uh, in the space. And it really became a passion of mine. I started to learn more about it and, you know, more about the philosophy behind Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies and and started to look around for a project to get involved with. And Dash really stuck out to me as one of the few projects that was focused on consumer facing issues with dig, you know digital currencies. And so um, as I got more and more involved in the project as a volunteer, I eventually, you know, just decided <laughs> I'm going to pursue my passion here. And who Work knows if it'll work the out. Room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, who knows if it'll work out, but it'll be interesting for sure. You mentioned that you, you just saw the need in the marketplace for cryptocurrency. What specific needs did you see? Well, when you look at electronic payment methods, almost all of them were adopted or, or adapted rather from another technology that wasn't meant for use online. Hmm. Um, there are a couple of exceptions like PayPal, but when you think about credit cards or uh, checks, the ACH system here in the United States, many of the bank transfer systems, they they uh, started out as physical systems. Uh, checks mm. used to be like literally gathered up and uh, sent into a public clearinghouse and redistributed back to banks, and and it was a physical process that got made into an electronic one at some point. And and when you start with a physical process and then migrate to a process that's electronic, you usually end up with something suboptimal. Oh, yeah. It's going to be like uh, <laughs> legacy systems and uh, uh, cludging uh, duct tape solutions together. Exactly. And so just take credit cards as an example. Uh, in order to use them online, you have to enter your payment credentials. You have to enter your credit card number into mm. a website and hope that that website isn't hacked. Um, and, and that is a solution that uh, we all pay for in the form of increased fraud rates, um, increased number of hacks of our information. And it's not well suited for an online digital form of payment. Uh, cryptocurrency clearly is. It it really addresses all of those needs. And uh, from a merchant perspective, it has advantages as well. It, there are no chargebacks with a cash transaction. And so when I receive Bitcoin, there's no probability that uh, someone is going to cr- claim that that was sent to me fraudulently and try to get that back. It's interesting, though, isn't it? Because uh, then you have sort of the counter problem that comes out of that, which is, yes. uh, <laughs> all right, no one can get it back. But how do you uh, uh, do, does that just shift trust onto merchants at this point? In, in many ways, it does. But there are markets where that's appropriate and markets where that's not appropriate. Mm. Um in the case of 
uh, you know, a, a very trusted merchant like Nordstrom or something like that that is known for having a great return policy, great customer service, that probably isn't a concern for customers because they know that that merchant will uh, take good care of them um, and make them whole. Another example is high chargeback industries where the consumer conducts a lot of fraud. Mm. Um, an example of this is online travel. People buy a hotel room or a flight and they later change their plans and regret the purchase that's non-refundable. And so a lot of people fraudulently claim that uh, it wasn't them that uh, did that transaction. And, and so ultimately those costs are passed along to honest consumers. And mm. so there's a lot of value on the table, even for the consumers in that environment to, uh, you know, use a payment method like cash uh, that doesn't allow that type of fraud to take place. And so I think it's use case dependent. I don't think that any payment solution is ever going to go away. <laughs> uh, we still use checks. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's more about, yeah, and it's more about like what payment method suits a particular need. Mm -hmm. And I believe that digital currencies play a, a, can play a significant role in online commerce and in uh, really setting a floor for how bad a fiat currency can become. Hmm. Uh, and so I think that there's just a, a definite use case for, for these um, assets. They can add a lot of value um, to transactions. And I think that uh, it, it became very clear to me that, that these are going to not only survive, but uh, carve out a significant portion of the payment space. To be honest, I haven't seen a check in about 10 years. Um, <laughs> maybe a cultural difference because I'm over here in Europe at this point. Well, being in Germany, you probably hardly ever see anything but electronic transfers so that's true this uh you we don't uh, see too many credit cards either i remember trying to buy furniture once and uh, they they don't accept credit card at ikea it's uh, it's very much a cash society over here or mm -hmm. transfer one um i find it very interesting that you identified these needs early on and decided to make the move into volunteering with the dash project and then becoming part of it um, we're seeing more and more big banks and, uh, and other financial instruments, uh, wall street hinting that they want to get into crypto or actively doing it, appointing crypto, uh, or blockchain, uh, people, uh, officers. And, but it still seems to be relatively slow compared to the lightning speed of the crypto industry. What sort of things do you think are holding big finance back from entering the market? And do you imagine that they're going to overcome it before uh, the crypto industry has moved on without them? Well, I think that there are probably two main things that are holding them back. Uh, the first is risk management. I think this is a completely new area for them. At the end of the day, banks are about uh, mitigating their own risk, particularly compliance risk. Um, they don't want to run afoul of the regulators. And, and these assets pose unique challenges compared to other assets um, in terms of remaining compliant uh, with know your customer and anti-money laundering and a lot of things. And so I think they're just cautious on that front. Hmm. I think the second thing is... Uh, they potentially have a lot to lose um, or gain by being involved in this market. And big organizations uh, tend to be bureaucratic. And when there's a lot of uncertainty around a decision, um, the result is usually stagnation in the decision-making process because there's a lot of stakeholders within the bank that need to get on board with any particular actions. And so working through those issues can take time. And I suspect that they are taking, taking it seriously, but moving very cautiously. And so I, I think that um, 
they will eventually get there. I don't think they're worried about necessarily missing out um, or being left behind because I think at the end of the day, uh, all payment systems and, and financial systems benefit from interaction points or connectivity. Uh, we need connectivity into the fiat world in and out hmm. uh, or cryptocurrency uh, isn't that useful in the short term. And so I, I think that uh, they will eventually get there. I think they'll eventually make decisions that are appropriate for their business and we'll see greater integration in the future. Uh, but yeah, they are moving slowly. I think that uh, that it is appropriate when you view it from their perspective. Hmm. I guess that makes sense. Uh, I mean, I've talked to a lot of people who are running their own crypto projects, their own ICOs, and one of the most common complaints I hear is even just getting a bank account is challenging for a startup in the blockchain space. Uh, especially in that is true. Yep. So <laughs> that is true. Um, it's something that we have had to spend a great deal of time on, even though we don't actually run any cryptocurrency service. We don't run the Dash network. Uh, we do software development for an open source project. Um, and even in that context, it was not, it has not always been easy for us to, uh, obtain financial services. Hmm. And of course we need to interact with the real world and, and, um, you know, that means having those fiat on ramps and off ramps and bank accounts and all of the traditional things that you would expect in order for us to uh, fluidly do our jobs. Hmm. And so, yeah, it, it is a challenge. Well, the fear of loss is always a bigger motivator for humans than the promise of gain. So I guess it would make sense if institutions that had a lot to lose were a little more cautious than the retail investor who wanted to uh who wanted to get their hands on some crypto and maybe this is why we see the family offices more quickly jumping into the space because they have more freedom to move in that way oh yes uh far fewer regulatory hurdles um and yeah far greater freedom um the ability to to uh coalesce around an idea quickly so i i do think that 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 plays a huge role. Adoption is always a tricky question because there are so many elements to it. And we talk a little bit about Wall Street's uh, hindrances to adoption, but Dash is really focused on the B2C market, or I guess B2B2C market. Uh, and you have a lot of challenges surrounding the adoption of individual consumers with digital payments. What do you see some of the major hurdles, the biggest ones being, and uh, how do you think that they'll be best overcome? Well, we're very focused at Dash on the user experience and in creating technology that will enable a better user experience. I think that when you compare the experience of using a digital currency with uh, using a centralized service like uh, PayPal or Venmo, the user experience is completely different. Hmm. And, um, you know, the, the users that are seeing cryptocurrency for the first time, um, having to uh, input cryptographic addresses is a scary prospect. <laughs> they don't exactly look friendly. <laughs> no. Um, and what they're looking at is the underlying code of Bitcoin or, or whatever cryptocurrency um, they're dealing with. And, um, it is not an ideal user experience. Um, there are other problems with it. It's much slower than credit cards, for example. Um, and so we focused a lot on improving the user experience in a variety of different ways. Our most popular service is Instant Send that allows transactions to go through within about a second and a half, about the same as a credit card authorization occurs. Mm -hmm. um, and those transactions are locked in place. They're double spend proof. The merchant can allow you to walk out the door with goods or services right away and not wait for six confirmations on the blockchain. So. Uh, that really improves the user experience quite a lot and one of the major hurdles. But we think probably the bigger opportunity is just doing away with ever uh, having the consumer face um, 
a cryptographic address. When you think about really successful peer-to-peer -peer payment systems, and uh, these are not true peer-to-peer -peer payment systems like, like Venmo, but um, they're username based. I get to log in, uh, I get to search for friends and send a friend request, mm -hmm. have them accept it. And when a payment comes in or I send a payment, uh, my name is presented to them, not a cryptographic address. And that's the way it should be. That's the bar that consumers are comparing their user experience against. Um, and so w we think by addressing that, and, and we're going to do that in our next version called Evolution, um, you'll be able to log in from any device, see a consistent contacts list. So if I friend you on my mobile device, on my you know mobile phone, it'll show up on my tablet. Um, I'll be able to transact and see my transaction history and it's all username based. So it's a very clean experience. I, I just need to be able to send and send payment requests. Um, uh, that That's the functionality that is most successful in the marketplace. Um, in the traditional finance world, and yet that hasn't been replicated within the cryptocurrency space. Uh, so we think that's really important to get right: is this user experience. One of the one of the big challenges is just that it looks technical. You know, when I, when I think of my parents or my uh, heaven forbid my grandparents trying to accept digital currency payments, and you know when they can't uh, figure out a URL. All right, my parents aren't that bad, but but still, it's a, it, I could imagine it being intimidating for mass adoption. But I'm almost imagining the opposite problem if we get a good user experience of things like spoofing names or challenges that come with the lack of precision that a address would have. Yes, so I, I think that those issues need to be worked through. You're beginning to see that, by the way, in in centralized networks like Venmo, where, uh, you know, people accidentally send to the wrong address or, uh, but there are ways around it. Um, you can, you know, add a picture, you can um, add functionality that ensures that the person you intend to send the, the, the money to is the correct recipient. And so we will have to add to that level of security over time. Um, in, in the base functionality and continue to iterate and improve. All of these you know, products and projects in the space are going to have to continually evolve and improve and, and try to keep up with the rest of the market. And so I think that uh, ultimately these services are in competition with one another mm -hmm. and, and we're going to have to deliver a, a superior experience, security being one of those components. One of the questions that has always come back to my mind, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I believe that these are all dangers on the right road, uh, but it's always been something that's been in my mind about key management. You know, the more money that you have in cash, the more danger there is that someone's just going to break in and steal it. And the more money you have in, in a wallet, the more danger that you lose the key or someone, uh, someone comes along and takes it. And this has uh, always been a question of how do you deal with that when you're do, trying to move everyday transactions to the crypto space? Um, someone once told me that, uh, and this has stuck with me, that the average person cares much more about a properly well-managed infrastructure than they do about decentralization. And... I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is it worth trading off some of the centralization for proper key management and uh, uh, for the mass market? Or do you think that it's better to keep it as decentralized as possible with people maintaining control over their wallets, no matter how much is in them? Well, I think that there is a balance here and uh, probably the market is best to define what the proper balance is. Um, I think that the technology itself is, at its very nature, decentralized. Uh, services are built on top of that. Um, you know, one of the integrations we're going through right now is with BitGo, and BitGo is a very sophisticated platform for 
institutions to be able to manage their keys. And they can do sophisticated things like split keys up and require, you know, three of five signers and uh, a number of other, uh, you know, sophisticated capabilities, roles that you can assign, uh, provers, um, different components of the system that allow you to very custom in a very customized way determine what it takes to move funds out of a vault situation. Um, there's also things that we can do in a decentralized way um, to better manage things. One of the ideas that we've been talking about for some time is uh, the concept of vault accounts, where they're subject to delays when I initiate a transaction. So if someone uh, hacks into my account and forces the movement of a large amount of funds, um, I have up to 24 hours to send a message that uh, reverses or eliminates that transaction from occurring. And uh, in such a way, not only do I have the ability to stop a hack after it's occurred, but the motivation of the hacker to even attempt one has been reduced significantly. And so I, I think there are ways that we can deal with some of these issues to mitigate risk. I think there are services out there that can uh, manage risk um, in very sophisticated ways. And ultimately, as long as all of those choices are available to the consumer or to the uh, companies that are dealing with these blockchains, they'll make decisions that are appropriate for the amount that they're dealing with and the level of security they require. Mm. Before we uh, began the interview uh we had mentioned briefly about uh talked briefly about adoption and you had mentioned that you've uh, seen some exciting uh some exciting growth in venezuela yes so uh we had some community members late last year form a, a group within venezuela to uh, help promote uh dash adoption and uh, educate they've held uh, a series of conferences. They've set up uh, help desks to help people get set up with wallets, support desks where they can uh, call in and, and get help. And it's been very successful. Uh, as of February, I think there were around 40 or 50 merchants that accepted Dash. Today, we're around 850. Wow. And the uptake rate is is increasing every single month. I think last month they signed up over 250 merchants in the month of July, and they're on pace to exceed that by a wide margin here in, in August. And so it's really resonated with the market there. We've seen literally hundreds a month signing up at this point. And at this point, I, I believe that traffic that we're seeing on the dash.org website is up to uh, Venezuela is up to number two on the country list behind only the United States in terms of interest and activity. And that's really astonishing. And what's driving the adoption there is obviously the the uh, condition of the local currency, the Bolivar. Uh, they're expecting a million percent inflation this year in the Bolivar. And when you have hyperinflation like that, where literally the value of your your currency is going down by 80 percent per month you will gladly accept the volatility of a digital currency like bitcoin or dash over holding your funds in a local currency that will almost certainly devalue by a, a large margin even accepting credit cards costs a lot more there in real terms because in the three days it takes for the credit card transaction to settle to your bank account, the value of that transaction has gone down by a measurable amount. And so the ability to receive funds instantly and in a currency that that isn't uh, uh, that is functional as a currency um, has a lot of value for these people. And so we're seeing a massive amount of adoption there. And one of the brokers that deals with Dash uh, in terms of fiat input in and out um, locally, mm -hmm. uh, they've seen uh, around 85% of their transactions are now in Dash as opposed to Bitcoin. Wow. And so people are actually using this to buy and sell goods and it's being adopted and used. 
Dash is one of the few cryptocurrencies that during this market downturn has actually seen an increase in the number of transactions on their network. Usually it's highly correlated with price mm -hmm. and therefore most likely speculators. Uh, but Dash, I believe what we're seeing is actual use increasing. Uh, and I believe that a large portion of that is happening within Venezuela. <laughs> Wow, it's uh, it's interesting to see an entire market become an active pilot, and I mean, one of the things that people have talked about for as long as Bitcoin has been around has been the question of whether crypto could be sort of like gold, a, a recession-proof, economic trouble-proof asset, and. I, uh, it's still the jury's still out on it. I mean, it it seems that most crypto Bitcoin will end up go following the market at this point because partly because of speculators. But it's interesting to see that when things really go downhill, like Ven the Venezuelan Bolivar, that uh, that it it, is, it ends up behaving as expected with something like Dash. I, I think it's very heartening. I think that. You know, Bitcoin is being used more as a store of value than a means of transacting, both because the transaction fees are higher with Bitcoin and because um, it it uh, it certainly has more ability for fiat on ramps and off ramps in a lot of places. So I think long, you know, people are are using it more like digital gold, and Dash is really viable for two reasons. One is because of the instant transactions, it makes it viable at the point of sale. Mm. Um, that's something that that most cryptocurrencies would not be good at because they take too long to confirm. Um, and so I think that's one aspect. The other is the very low fees. We have micro fees on our, our network. The average transaction is about a penny or a tenth of a penny. And an instant transaction is is one to two cents. So in an environment like Venezuela, where, you know, every penny counts, um, when it comes to transacting, uh, what we're seeing is that, that Dash is the preferred method. I'm glad that you came on our show. We're out of time now, but thank you for joining me. Ryan Taylor is the Dash Core CEO coming from Wall Street all the way to the crypto world. I wish you all the best going forward. Well, thank you very much for having me on again. Thank you.